Yo, what's up? Welcome back to my channel once again. Today I'll be checking out this video of uh, Jordan Peterson talking with uh, Margit Wadi, a Senegalese entrepreneur, talking about some issues regarding Africa. Let's see how it goes. Well, you, you list here in one of your articles uh, where you make re reference to these rating systems, the bottom 10 countries for doing business in the world, Chad, Haiti, Central African Republic, Congo, Democratic Republic, South Sudan, Libya, Yemen, Venezuela, there's a lovely example, Eritrea and Somalia. And so there are three exceptions in yeah. the African ecosystem. Yeah. Mauritius, Rwanda, Kenya, South Africa, Botswana, and Zambia. You pointed out in your pros prospectus, is it prospectus yeah, article? Yeah, prospectus article of uh, right, Art right. Institute. Mm -hmm. Right, that Mar Mauritius is a rising star, uh, and Rwanda is in some ways comparable to Georgia. So some of these countries have started to get this right. Yes. And so what's the consequence of that? And what does right mean? What they have understood, what these countries have understood, is that economic freedom is at the center for prosperity building. Uh, Rwanda, for example, Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, is explicit about it. He said he wants to be the Lee Kuan Wu of, he wants to be the Singapore of Africa, and <laughs> Lee Kuan Wu is his model. Now, the dirty mouths are gonna start shouting, oh yeah, see, authoritarian, blah, blah, blah. What yeah, that's one thing that comes up in especially in most of the, of the critics of, of uh, Kagame. Whenever his name is mentioned, so many are quick, especially Westerners, are quick to point out about human rights. He's a dictator. I don't know his country. It's not free. Let's keep listening. Me, I want to talk only about the, um, econ on the economic side. If you take Lee Kuan Wu and Singapore as your example, then it means that like him, you're going to have to be serious about economic freedom. And that's exactly what he did. That's what Singapore did. When Singapore figured that out, they went on to put in the right reforms to make their environment the most, some of the most business friendly environments in the world. Yeah, yeah. and be, before we go too far, uh, uh, just had an afterthought. Uh, the way she just said uh, those things about authoritarianism and uh, whatever, and she just said, for me, I'll just look on the economic reform side. So that I think that is uh, one of the things that maybe, I don't know how to put it. I think it's one of the ways that people maybe can be looking at, at African leaders, not even African leaders, just anyone in general, because uh, if you just point out uh, he's a dictator, he's an authoritarian, and maybe he's doing good things for his country we, on the economic side. He's uh, on the economic development side. So I don't know how we should uh, we should be able to balance out uh, a person's maybe political side and also on the other side, so that if in the end there's something good coming out of it, should we just uh, general put it in general and say this person is not good for the country or? How should we handle it? Because even in many other countries, we know there's no one political leader that is a uh, hundred percent good. That people say this guy is good one hundred percent. So I don't know how we can uh, balance that. It's just a thought that came up. One of the most free markets environment in the world, and you saw the magic of Singapore. Today, Singapore is richer than its ex-colonizer. Great Britain. So when I hear people telling me today, oh, Africa is poor because of colonization, <laughs> I'm like, please, let's move on from that. that <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Not even, I uh, said, many, many people say, but especially Africans themselves say that we are not able to achieve what other countries are achieving because we had been colonized. Yet the colonization took part so many years ago and uh, yeah, I think she's right. Does it have that. maybe a tiny percentage in where we are today? Maybe, maybe, and I don't know. But I know it's not the cause, because if it were many countless countries have been colonized before, and by the way, colonizing one another 
is, is humanity's history. It just happened that maybe African, Africa has been one of the, the, the last, you know, um, colonized region in the world. So in our psyche, it, it, it is there and it acts like nothing happened before to others. But uh, flash news, it's the history of the world. We've been capturing each other back and forth, all of that. So anyway, but the truth is um, Singapore, richer than Great Britain today. And then Hong Kong happened. And then because Hong Kong happened, China even today happened. Because China's like, wait a minute, what, con- what went on over there? And then China went on to do the exact same thing with its SEZs, the special economic zones, some of the most free market zones in the world. And then look at it happen in communist China, who, when it comes to economics, decided that we're going to do the free market, we're going to be capitalist, because that's the only way we tried everything else. We killed hundreds of millions of people. And, and we have... And we have <laughs> but they, I think that's also uh, 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 it opens up uh, up our minds, especially when we think about Africa, because Africa is so hung up on this thing of like we are stuck. We, we cannot do a drastic change. We are just doing our change comes too slow and maybe to a detriment. For example, the way she has given an example of China. China used to be so different twenty years ago. Yet they made some very drastic reforms and it changed them for good so i don't know why in africa we are not able to do that tweak just to get get over with <laughs> these hang-ups and move on just do as some kind of drastic change that will have uh, immediate effect have nothing to show for it but now that we're tired of being disrespected members of society because guess what that's the other thing too you want to be respected in this world you're gonna mm-hmm. have to be among the, mo- the prosperous ones for other reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, that's also a very good point. <laughs> for you to get respect from others, you you have to be prosperous because uh, yeah, again, in Africa, most most countries and most people, their mentality is this victim mentality of being uh, of every time complaining and whining that oh we, we suffered from this, oh we are suffering from this, or, okay, but. As, as she said, guess what? That kind of mentality and that being a victim every time and being every time negative things, you, you, you are being associated with negative things, we will never be, be able to gain any, any respect or gain any foothold in the table of um, when the world is talking about important things. We will never get noticed or given any any time or any respect because we are always on the downside. So I guess that's a, that's a thing that maybe most of us need to It'd rethink. It's nice, G, that we respect people just because? Absolutely. But that's really not the world we live in. So when China got tired of being disrespected, they're like, maybe we've got to build also some prosperity here because then they're going to hear us. And today, China, being one of the, you know, being where it is at, even Hollywood... Hollywood, who tries to tell the world how to think, is being told by China what movies to make and how to tweak stories and history in order to be palatable for them. You see the power that comes with with being prosperous. What would you recommend concretely to countries like Senegal to get the hell out of the way, let's say, of the people who would, like you, would try to, would do everything they could to try to make it better? I mean, one of the things that happened with India is India established the Indian Institute of Technology, which is a deadly yeah. engineering school, and a huge number of its graduates went to Silicon Valley, as you well know. Yeah. And many of the successful Indian graduates of IAT started to dump money back into India and build a, a capitalist infrastructure <laughs> there, or help build a capitalist infrastructure there. <laughs> That's another thing that I don't think could be happening in Africa anytime soon, because when our, our most elite, our... What can I, uh, how can I put it? When we get our people to go to the, to the outside world and gain uh, skills, especially those very technical things he's talking about, and gain capital and whatever, they go and stick there. They don't come back. I know there was a program in the 80s and whatever brought by Kennedy from the uh, U.S. to take people from Africa, get them the skills in the U.S., and then take them back when they have the skills so that they can help develop their own societies. But what happened is that 90% of them stuck there. And even the what she's, uh, what he's talking about, sending back even the capital itself, and they, they were not 
There, I don't think that will be happening because people, when you, they come out of Africa and go there, they just stick there. They don't want to to go back to the society. Only a, a very few would do that. <laughs> so this sort of thing can really take hold. If you were making recommendations to governments who wanted to get on board and stop being like Chad, Haiti, <laughs> Central African Republic, Congo, South Sudan, Libya, Yemen, and Venezuela, etc., what what concrete step, steps should they take right. from the bottom up to get the hell out of the way? Exactly. So two things we've been doing uh, because I'm an I'm a practitioner as that's my entrepreneurial journey. I'm an entrepreneur, so I practice what I preach, uh, but I also preach. I preach for free markets, and so when it comes to that, I'm I'm. One of the hats that I wear is as the um, director for the African Center for Prosperity of the Atlas Network, the largest organization in the world of um, free market think tanks around the world. And so what we do there is we work on um, reforms around the world to take down barriers of entry for local entrepreneurs. So that's one thing. But as we Mm -hmm. all know, that's a great initiative to take, and we've been making some really um, good advances. Yeah, yeah, because those those barriers of entry into doing business in any country, I think they are one of the worst things. I think it's one of the worst things that a country can do to itself. For example, in a country in Kenya, it's so hard. It has been rated as one of the... Uh, to to start a business or to gain entry and start doing business is very hard compared to, as uh, she was saying about Rwanda. In Rwanda, it takes a very short time, but in Kenya, you'll be you'll be required to maybe the registration itself. You'll be required to to find multiple licenses. It will take so long because these multiple licenses they are being offered by different agencies of the same government. Maybe even these people they are even in the same ministry, but they are given different licenses. So it takes a long time for you to be able to establish and also the inspection, the whatever, all the things that you are required. You might take years trying. You have the capital. You have the everything but just for you to start to get to hit the ground it will take a long time and i think it has come to it's affecting us negatively because many countries have been coming and when they find all these bureaucracy and all these uh, barriers and uh, blockades to there they just give up and go somewhere else in uh, in, in uh, many countries especially in ghana we've been making a lot of progress with our partners there imani but um piecemeal but that is piecemeal legislation it takes forever it is hard as heck and by the time you mm-hmm. made a gain here you made 20 losses over there and it's an continuous problem but until we get better we got to continue at it so that's one thing we've been doing and so that's uh, a hat i wear working with free market think tanks to try to make it easier for en- local entrepreneurs to, to 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 join in the party uh additionally i'm going bold i'm going radical for the past few years uh we've been advocating um an idea for africa that um found some of its roots in um, in Latin America. And again, I'm related to the people who are involved in this. My husband being one of the key figures in this movement, a movement called the Charter Cities. Paul Romer calls it like that. He's a Nobel laureate in economics. Um, others calls it, call it the free cities. I like to call it the startup cities. So the best way to think about it, Jordan, and it goes back to what you were talking about earlier when you said, when you use the word operating software, most of the poor uh, developing, most of the low-income nations, so meaning back in the days, the way we used to call it, is poor nations, are, they have regulations for poverty. They're basically regulated for poverty, meaning the laws, the set of law, poverty. It only calls poverty. And so what some of these fo- folks have thought about, looking at the Dubai example, Dubai just recently entered the top 10 of the international financial centers of the world. And what Dubai did at some point is think about it and be like, on this bare, you know, sand, plot of sand (laughs) that's technically worth nothing right now, as is, this 110 acres of land, sand everywhere, they're like, well, maybe Sharia law is not the best for business. Um, We got to think about better set of laws for business. We're talking about only about business, not family law, not anything else but business. And they decided there's got to be something better. And so they looked around, and that's actually when, to take one of the terms you used earlier, they're starting to realize, hmm, common law is actually a better way for business, specifically British common law. 
So at that point, and <laughs> that's the other thing about uh, African countries and uh, just Africans in general. Uh, the way she has said that light bulb or that uh, that moment when it hits you, something needs to be done. It seems uh, in Africa, in most of our countries, we don't do that. We are never, we never ha had that time when it hits us that something needs to be done. We are always on this uh, kind of. I don't know who to call it. Okay, it's not as if we don't have a goal to achieve, but it's as if we are on this. It's it's lagging. We are just lagging. We are just it lags on too long before anything, any new good idea can come up. We are just, we are just as I said before, it takes. We are just too slow in uh, coming up with any solutions to anything. Even being innovative, as uh, she's giving an example of Dubai. Uh, maybe people coming down and thinking, okay, what do we have? What can we do? I think in Africa, it takes too long for that to happen. For, unless someone comes and gives us a push and tells us, hey, hey, guys, you know what? <laughs> so you need to wake up. For ourselves, it takes too long. I'm oversimplifying here because otherwise we can totally geek out on it. Remember, this is like one of my latest things that I've been involved in. Uh, but latest, it's been the past 10 years. And I'm going to share with you a win. Um, so Dubai is like, we have to adopt British, um, you know, common law, primarily British common law. We're going to hire retired mm -hmm. British common law judges to come and educate the law here, train our own people. And that, along with many other reforms, to also become a top center uh, when it comes to the... Um, and, and, and in the free market when it comes to the finances, Dubai... Yeah, well, that British common law, that British common law system, so it's very, very interesting theologically and metaphysically. So it's predicated on the idea that people have... Every individual has all the rights that there are, except for those that are specifically regulated and limited by legal necessity. And then generally that, that realm of necessity has emerged only as a consequence of disputes between people. So you're free to do whatever you want unless you have a dispute with someone else. Then the dispute is adjudicated according essentially to constitutional and theological principles, and then a precedent is established then the whole body of law built up that body of precedence. Yes. Yeah, and it's bottom up, not it's, top down. It's eh? totally and bad. English common law is a gift. <laughs> it's bottom up. Uh, for those of you, of you from Kenya, <laughs> I think that uh, resonates with something. The bottom up. <laughs> from God, yeah. man. No, it's something else. Absolutely. And that's the key word there when you said bottom up. So common law is so much better for <laughs> bottom up approaches. And we all know that markets work better in a bottom up approach. And and also, when they have to educate the law and um, resolve a dispute, they're going to be much more respectful to the contract that was passed between the two parties than, say, civil law would be, right? Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, so from this standpoint here, you have to... <laughs> maybe maybe uh, uh, Dr. Ruto, the president of Kenya, maybe he can uh, borrow a leaf from his uh, bottom-up approach of uh, the plan that he has for reviving the Kenyan economy. Maybe he can borrow a leaf <laughs> from uh, this market already because uh, in, his, in his policy, I've not heard him talk about the law, about legal, about legislation. He just talks about this kind of uh, economic reforms, but he does not talk about the, the law itself because uh, as uh, she's explaining, I think... Uh, uh, one of the, and I, I had not thought about it until I saw most of her lectures and her public uh, speech. And I noticed uh, one of the th things that is a detriment to our, uh, that is actually causing and leading to poverty in Africa is our, our legal system. Uh, it's the laws we have, as I said, maybe getting the license, maybe getting things done and whatever. Uh, Business law that that we have is is a detriment to ourselves. It's not uh, it's not helping us in any positive way to get rid of the poverty. Actually, it is contributing. It is contributing because when the companies come to start business, even the local entrepreneurs themselves, when they are trying to do business, and the legal handles they become too much. They, it's 
I, I think it's, it's something we, we ought to sit down and have a deep think about. But who's not trying to put all of this together and eventually they put a set of laws together that would now be conducive to being a top international financial center in the world. And voila, in less than a generation, in less than 25 years, Dubai completely unrecognizable. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's just part of it. Uh, you can watch the whole thing on, on her link. And uh, you can notice uh, this, this is an African, this Margaret Ward is an African, and she's able to come up with these policies and these ideas that uh, are actually very eye-opening and uh, very progressive. Uh, she's not hung up on the whole victim mentality of uh, an inferiority complex of uh, many Africans have. So you can go and uh, find more her lectures online and you'll see, you'll be able to see how, on how she, she has this uh, perspective on how to solve uh, African poverty and the things, other things in Africa. So that's it. Uh, you can let me know about your thoughts in the comment section below. That's it for today. Kindly subscribe if you have not subscribed uh, so that you can get my video whenever it comes out and uh, share and tell others about my channel. Uh, see you next time. I'm out.